All right, good evening. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're so glad you joined us for Trees Talk to Each Other with uh, Sharon Eversman. Our theme this year for Gallatin Valley Earth Day is Under One Canopy, Celebrating Trees and Forests. So this is the perfect talk to kick, up, kick off our season of uh, talks. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of talks, workshops, and films planned this year uh, with subjects ranging from white bark pine to wildfires to old growth forests, to name a few. Uh, to learn more and register for some of these events, you can visit our website at gallatinvalleyearthday.org. I'm thrilled to see all of you here tonight, and I also want to welcome all of you who are joining us online. I know we had over 300 people uh, sign up for the live stream. That was quite exciting. Uh, my name is Ann Reddy, and I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. And uh, I can't wait to hear Sharon's talk about this fascinating subject of, uh, about how trees communicate with each other. But before I do that, I just wanted to give a thank you to all our sponsors. Um, our whole series of talks is are free because of the support from our local businesses, our government agencies and organizations in our community. I'd like to start by thanking the Greater Gallatin United Way, um, who is our fiscal sponsor and our premier sponsors, the city of Bozeman, uh, Volkswagen. Oh, thank you. Just had a reminder that, whoops, for some reason the slides aren't working. Sorry. Sometimes it freezes. That's working. Okay, thank you. Thanks to our tech person, Rich Reddy. Much appreciated. <laughs> okay, so our premier sponsors, uh, I'd like to thank them, the city of Bozeman, Volkswagen of Bozeman and Audi Bozeman. And then we have our benefact benefactor sponsors, Sacagawea Audubon Society and our local radio station, KB, KGVM, get it right. And our stewards, Bridger Bowl Ski Area, Happy Trash Can and Gallatin Wildlife Association. And of course, all of our community members who volunteer to help make this happen. Without their generous support, um, we wouldn't be able to bring you tonight's program. And last but not least, I just wanted to thank the City of Bozeman Public Library for being a partner for this event. And now on to our program. Uh, before I introduce Sharon, I just wanted to uh, let you know that there will be a question and answer period um, when her talk is over. Uh, for those of you who are um, joining us online, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's uh, it says Q&A. So you can press the Q&A for a question and answer and a, a little box will pop up and you can type in your questions there and then Rich will read them to Sharon. Uh, if you're in the audience, uh, just raise your hand and I'll come around with, uh, with a microphone for you so you can ask your question to Sharon. Um, okay, well now, um, I'm honored to introduce Sharon Eversman. Uh, Sharon taught biology, general botany, and plant anatomy uh, as part of the Department of Ecology at Montana State University for nearly 40 years. Uh, her primary research interest was lichens, and she worked in national forests in Montana, uh, including the Yellowstone National Park, Teton National Park, as well as forests all over the country. She holds a master's degree in plant ecology from Montana State University. And then she also has a PhD from Arizona State University. So I'd like you to help me um, uh, give her a round of applause and invite her to the stage. And thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Tech check. Okay. <laughs> so this, the microphone should work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming out on our winter night. About time we got one, but it didn't have to come quite so quickly, quite so fast. Um, 
the title is Trees Talk to Each Other because this has been some common kind of, of um, conversation in the press and magazines. It's not something really that you'd hear in the science department, um, but we'll, we'll cover that. So let me check. By the way, I've got my email here because sometimes people have a question um, after a, a program is over or they have a comment or they, you know, a comment like, what? Something like that. <laughs> So just as a reminder, there are basically three kinds of trees. We've got the conifer forest, especially around here, and there are also the deciduous trees that lose, that lose their leaves in the fall. So when we think about conifers and something like an aspen, um, they're pollinated by the wind, so you're not gonna see flowers with them. Other kinds of deciduous trees have flowers, and then we know that there's a pollinator of some kind. Basically what I'll talk about tonight uh, includes all these kinds of trees. Um, they're all involved with the relationship I'll talk about. Okay. So let's think a little bit about trees and how they communicate and what they have to do. So trees have to attract pollinators and seed dispersal agents. Um, it's in their best interest to get away from mom, you know, get away from, from your, the parent tree. So they've got to get the seeds away. So first they have to attract the pollinators to pollinate the flowers to make the fruits and seeds. Then they usually have to attract some kind of animal or bird to eat those seeds and disperse the seeds away. That takes chemistry, right? That's why fruits turn color. So they uh, get sweeter, they get more red, they get more visible. That says seeds are ready to disperse, come get them. And then disperse them. So at the same time, they're trying to attract things Trees have to repel things. They have to repel the predators, the insects, the, the elk, the deer, the whatever, um, which means that at the same time they have attracting kind of chemicals, they have uh, toxins, kind, toxic kinds of chemicals and things that don't taste good. And then communication um, with each other and with predators. So you're familiar actually with one of these kinds of, of communication molecules. And that's if you know anything about fruit ripening, you know that if you have a bad apple in a sack of apples, pretty soon all the apples get ripe and yucky. That's a, a, a chemical called ethylene. It's a, it's a gaseous kind of hormone. And that's communicating. It's actually in, to the benefit of the fruit that says, okay, we're all ready to be dispersed. Come eat the fruits go poop out the seeds someplace else. But what we'll talk about tonight is communication with each other. How do trees communicate with each other? So lots of lab work has been done with this and a lot of it is done with, with um, plants like tomatoes and uh, beans, garden type of crops because gardeners wanna know how, how do plants repel insect uh, enemies, for example. So here's one kind of study where one plant, I can't see this on the screen, where one plant is stressed with, with insects, with fungi, with something, and that uh, entices a uh, a hormone inside the plant called jasmonic acid. Jasmonic acid starts making the plant make defense chemicals. Those defense chemicals don't taste good in the first place. And then the second place, they also will travel through the air to a second plant. So then the second plant starts making its defensive defensive chemicals. So we have plants being able actually to communicate these defense chemicals with each other. That's been shown over and over and over again. It's been shown with the garden plants as well as with conifer seedlings, it's been shown. Now, one other little thing I'm gonna to toss in here because I just read about it not long ago was <clears throat> something called phytoacoustics that um, plants detect sound. So that's, they kind of do. I mean, sound waves travel through the air and they're vibrations and the leaves can pick up vibrations. So they're learning that this plant number two can pick up maybe the sound made by a caterpillar chewing an, a, a plant. Is that outlandish? Think about eating a salad. They're crunchy, right? Leaves are crunchy. Okay, so phytoacoustics, stay tuned. That's gonna be kind of a cool new area of research. 
So in nature, this is the best known system of that kind of warning system. In Africa, there's a tree called the acacia. And this kind of acacia, as you can see, has thorns um, with it. Other kinds of acacias do not. They have a different defense system um, using ants, actually. We won't go there, but it's fun to talk about. Um, the giraffes nibble on the acacias. The acacias produce tannins. Now, this is really common. Uh, the, the pines in Yellowstone produce lots of tannins when the elk chew on them. The tannins reduce protein kinds of digestion in the animals, and the animals can actually almost starve with a, with a stomach full because these tannins interfere with the digestion of the proteins. So in this case, there's a, the ethylene is produced, and it goes from this nibbled on plant to the acacias that have not been eaten and evidently can travel as far as 50 yards through the, through the air. And giraffes will avoid those second plants within 50 yards of the nibbled on acacias. Okay, so this is a gaseous kind of warning system. It can be shown in the lab between plants. It's really hard to show it in the forest. Well, maybe it happens. Now, the second part of this is what we'll spend most of the time on because this is what's been getting most of the, the popular press. And that's that plants are connected underground by fungi. In the lab, they can make it happen. In the real world, it happens, they're there. So here's another example of the type of lab test that's done where they will put some kind of a pest on plant number one. So it could be a fungus, it could be a caterpillar, it could be aphids. And again, these defense compounds are formed. The defense compounds go through the air to a second plant. And not only that, they can go through the ground via these mycorrhizae that connect the roots. So I'll talk a lot about the, the mycorrhizae, but this is considered to be a communication system between plants. Um, it's also possible and has been shown that some of these chemicals can go just through the soil. There's always water in the soil. So the chemicals can go through the water in the soil from one root to another. But the point is there are these movements of these chemicals um, between the two plants. So the word mycorrhiza, you might get sick of hearing it by the end of the night. Myco means fungus. Whenever you see the word myco, that means fungus. A mycologist studies fungi. Myco means fungus. Rhiza always means root. So mycorrhizae, fun fungus root. This complete uh, combination between the two things. So what we see above ground, we've got the trees, we've got the bushes, two kinds of trees here, is entirely dependent on what we see underground. So this is an example of what's called the mycorrhizal system, where you're seeing a combination of roots right here and extending down into here, but also these finest little things right here, those are fungal hyphae. So that's fungus. And then they come together to form one of these, some of these little nodules right here. And those are the mycorrhizal connections. That's, those are the actual mycorrhizae. So let's think a minute about fungi. Um, not all fungi are mycorrhizal. Fungi make their living in about four different ways. Um, some of them are decomposers, as you know, if you have you know, an old orange in the refrigerator or if you have a, a mildewy shower curtain or dead logs, um, the mycorrhizae in the soil that make uh, fairy rings. Those are decomposers. They're decomposing things in the soil. That's where they get their carbon compounds. When we say something needs food, something needs carbon compounds. We eat our carbon compounds. We eat meat, we eat veggies, we eat fruits. That's where we get them. That's where animals get them. That's where fungi get them. Plants make them. Plants make those original carbon compounds. That's photosynthesis. Some fungi are parasites which means they feed on living things. So these are nasty um, plant diseases, animal diseases in the tropics are just awful to look at. Um, we have trouble with that with the white bark pine rust, the, the, uh, the rust that's destroying the, the uh, white bark pines in the state and, and in Canada. 
That's a, fu that's a fungus, that's a parasite. Dutch elm disease is a parasite. Uh, the chestnut blight, that was a fungus disease. So some of them are parasites and all, lots and lots of work done in plant pathology departments on breeding uh, resistant strains to the various fungi. Some fungi hook up with algae and those are lichens. So that's how I got knee deep into studying fungi because lichens are 90% fungus. So fungi um, combine with algae to form lichens. And then here's what we'll talk about tonight. Some, some fungi are mycorrhizal. Now, when we look at a mushroom and here we've got several kinds, we've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, lots of different kinds of fungi. You can tell them apart above ground, but you can't tell them apart underground. Fungi hyphae all look the same. I mean, there are some little differences between major groups of fungi, but basically you can't tell them apart. Um, so all of this mess right here, this whole thing right here is called mycelium, mike, fungi, mycelium. And then each little thread, is a hypha. So each little thread is a hypha. So many are hyphae and lots of hyphae together form the mycelium. We don't see mycelia very often unless it happens to be growing on top of something. But there's lots of mycelium in, in your moldy cheese, for example, or in that bread that's starting to form little black things on it. Um, there's mycelium there that we don't see. And underground is really important. So let's talk about this thing called a mutualistic symbiosis, which means that both organisms benefit from this mycorrhizal association. So the fungi receive sugar from the plants. So if you know about photosynthesis, you know that the leaves are taking the CO2 from the air, water from the soil, um, plus they use sunlight and chlorophyll, and they break apart the water, they make, they make sugars. Then the sugars, some of them stay in the leaves for the activities, the respiration in the leaves. Some of the sugars go down the plant to be stored in the root. So most roots like this are storing lots and lots and lots of starch. So that's a major function of roots is to store that starch for when the plant needs it, for when they're not photosynthesizing. And in mycorrhizal plants, which is most of them, that sh the sugar goes into this hyphae right here. When there's enough nutrition in the fungal hyphae, they will fruit, they will form the mushroom. So if you see both of these together, you kind of know that the mycelium in the ground is getting enough nutrition from the plant that it's able to reproduce. So a mushroom is a reproductive structure. Now you can kind of see this, it isn't always appetizing, but you know, if you have a mushroom in the refrigerator and you don't use it right away, it gets browner and browner and browner on the underside, it's forming spores. So you could see those spores if you put them on a piece of white paper, you could see them just fall off and you could see all those spores that they're forming. Um, they're reproducing. So fungal spores are everywhere. So again, fungi are like animals, they have to, eat, they have to ingest their carbon compounds, then they don't keep that sugar. It usually goes in as sugar. It also could go in as amino acids from the plant to the fungus. And then it's changed to fungus compounds so it doesn't go back into the plant. That's true in lichens too. The change is immediately into the fungal compounds that the, the fungus uses. So it can't go in back into the algae or the plants. And then the mycorrhizae are only present in the youngest, smallest, tiniest roots. You're not going to find them up in here. That's not where they are. They're in these tiniest little ends of the roots right here. So what does the plant get from this? Um, roots are not all that efficient in many cases. They, they can't get into the soil between little tiny spots and they can't um, spread out far enough by themselves to get all of the minerals and uh, water that are needed for the plant. So what the fungi do is increase absorptive surfaces. So they spread out between little spoil particles much more efficiently than roots do. And they can get that phosphorus, they can get that nitrogen, they can get those micro elements, they can get the water and then uh, transfer those to the plant. So the plant is benefiting from this also. 
<laughs> and then a lot of research has been done. By the way, the system has been known for well over 100 years. Um, when they started doing a lot of research, I'd say starting in the 70s or 80s, what are the values to the plant besides just having maybe this absorption of benefit? They can protect plants against air, against pollution in the soil, that the pollutants go into the fungus, don't get into the plant. Uh, it can work with heavy metals. They, the heavy metals in the mining area can get into the fungus. They don't get into the plant. Not sure it's good for the fungus, but it's better for the plant. Root parasites, there's a lot of root parasites. Perhaps you've heard of the world's largest organism at one time was something called armillaria. It was a big fungus in Oregon, world's largest organism, right? That's a root parasite, um, deadly. But a good mycorrhizal system will help protect the plant against root parasites. There are lots of little hungry critters in the soil, little invertebrates in particular, and fungal hyphae, uh, we'll see in a minute, uh, can really protect the roots against anything that wants to eat those roots. And then certain fungi really help with drought, that they get enough water from the soil that it really helps the plant. So a true uh, mutualistic symbiosis. So in nature, at least 80% of the plants are mycorrhizal. That means if you look out in the forest, you can see the mountains around here. Every tree up there is mycorrhizal. Every bush up there is mycorrhizal. You look out in the natural grass parkland, those, those grasses are mycorrhizal. Um, in your yard, I'm not sure. That's Some of mine are, and I'm not sure about others, but 80% um, of plants definitely are hooked up with fungi. What kinds of things are not mycorrhizal? Um, generally annuals, uh, garden plants, a little annual weeds like mustards, because it takes a while to build up this relationship between the fungus and the roots. It takes a while to make those nodules. So generally, little weedy annuals are not mycorrhizal, and, and um, garden plants are not mycorrhizal. The plants, the flowers that you plant in your flower pots in the summertime, those are not mycorrhizal. So let's look at this system a little bit. As I said, 80% of plants uh, are mycorrhizal. Let's say basically all perennials are mycorrhizal. So in this diagram, we've got two different systems. And we've just kind of established that the plants can't live without the fungi. The fungi can't live without the plants. So we have a system here with two conifers and we can kind of see these colored hyphae in here that are combining with the roots. And they're combining the roots underground like this. And then here's something that has just been shown fairly recently. There's a kind of flower out there that is, it doesn't have chlorophyll. It's white. Uh, the pine drops are one of them. The, um, what's the other one? Coral root is another one. They flower, they've got leaves, but they don't have any chlorophyll. Where do they get their food? Well, they used to be called root parasites. It turns out now they think they're really hooking into the mycorrhizal system here more than the root parasites. So we have a system here with the trees and these um, plants like this. And then again, when there's enough nutrition in the mycelium, we can see the mushrooms right here. Now notice that that's not exactly combined with these things over here. So there are different kinds of mycorrhizae, as we'll see in just a minute, and they really don't talk, they don't work together at all. They, they're completely separate. So we have the wildflowers here, we have the grasses, and we have a different kind of a tree, and all of these can be combined, can be connected underground with the mycorrhizae, but they don't necessarily connect in any way with this other system. So we've got it's two kinds of systems that are operating. So the conifers and the mushrooms are connected with one system, and that other tree and the wildflowers and the grasses are another system. Let's look at the systems. Two basic kind of mycorrhizae, one is called endomycorrhizae or arbuscular. Arbuscular means tree-like, which means they're very branched. 
So these kinds of fungi, you will find with cedars, junipers, maples, ash, dogwood, sycamores. Okay, there are some of these trees and bushes. Grasses have these kinds of mycorrhizae, ferns and fern allies. This goes back a long ways. These are the first trees that ever developed and that, let's go back 200 million years for those. So these systems have been around for a long time, at least 200 million years. And in fact, they're starting to show that some mosses have mycorrhizae, which puts it back closer to 450 million years ago. We're talking old systems here. They've been, they've been in effect since they've been, had been land, land plants. And then of course, all the wildflowers that we have are uh, mycorrhizal. In this case, we have the fungi um, growing in the soil. And to see these, you have to take the tiniest roots, wash them off really well, stain them and look under a microscope. And then you can see these kinds of structures inside the cells. So arbuscular branched like this. So this shows one, these are, looks like scanning electron micrographs of so three-dimensional like this. This is the diagram to show you what's happening. And this is the important part. Um, cell membranes can't be punctured or the cell dies. The cell membrane is extremely important in keeping the integrity of a cell together. So what we have is this communication between the, the cell of the plant and the cells of the fungi. And the plant says, okay, I'm gonna let you grow in here. And the, the fungus can grow in here like this the cell membrane invaginates like that. And then there's lots of surface area here for sugars to get into the, into the fungus and for water, minerals, whatever, to get from the fungus into the plant. So you can see this under a microscope only. You can't really ever see this with, your, with a bare eye. So they think that the fungi recognize the plant that they're going to uh, colonize because of a secretion of a certain kind of plant hormone. And maybe this plant hormone stimulates the branching here that we see, because we don't see that in the other kind of uh, uh, mycorrhiza. And then that turns on genes for each other. This system has been worked out really, really well for rhizobium and nitrogen fixing plants. It hasn't been worked out quite so well for the, for the fungi um, plant relationships. So with this kind of fungus, this kind of mycorrhiza, there are only about 130 species of fungus. One major genus called Glomus, G-L-O-M-U-S, and that's, that's all over the place. And then again, they probably helped the earliest plants colonize the land. I wanna think the earliest things colonizing the land are lichens. The evidence is not showing that. <laughs> Uh, it's showing probably something more like liverworts or mosses. But again, they're showing that some of these mosses are were mycorrhizal. Are mycorrhizal. The other major kind of mycorrhiza is ectomycorrhizae, also abbreviated EM. These are the much more common ones in the woods, in the forests. So we've got these, all the pines, all the, the pine, spruce, Douglas fir, fir, spruce, aspens, birch, the big forest trees all have these kinds of fungi with them. In this case, the fungi do not penetrate the root cells. They, again, recognize that the, you've got the, the right species here. And the fungi grow around the root, the tiniest root. So this is a, a cross section of a root right here. And this is the part that has the xylem and the phloem that conducts the water up and the phloem and the sugars down. So the, the water and the sugars move from here into the cells. And then the fungi grow between the cells, not, it, not inside the cells. They grow between the cells and then around the outside like that. And that's what that structure looks like. That's visible with the naked eye. Those you can dig up if you know what you're looking for. You can dig those up at the base of the tree or in the drip line or wherever they may be. And you can see these. They're different colors. They're different shapes. Um, a good eye uh, can identify them all as the species by looking at, at these kinds of uh, mycorrhizal connections. Over 6,000 species of these ectomycorrhizal fungi. 
And then with more than one fungus can colonize one tree. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later too. So one tree can have many different kinds of fungi and one fungus can colonize many different kinds of trees. Some are specialists, some are generalists. Uh, the, the mycologists say they're promiscuous. <laughs> okay, so ectomycorrhizal species can communicate with other ectomycorrhizal species. Um, endomycorrhizal species can, uh, can communicate with endomycorrhizal species. They don't communicate with each other in the soil. So this just gives some idea of the extent of what you see underground with just this little one seedling. Now this, this was grown, probably some graduate student had this as a project and had to grow this mycorrhizal seedling. But it shows you this incredible network of little bitty above ground part, lots of roots, lots of fungi, and lots of connections right here. So here's some information about mycorrhizae. What plant chemicals might be involved in establishing this kind of association? We've got to have chemicals from the plant signaling the, the fungi. They don't just randomly get together in the soil. There are signals. So it could be terpenes, these, these um, things that make a pine smell good. Flavonoids, plant hormones. It depends on the plant, depends on the plant species, fungus species. Um, then the fungus recognizes those those exudates from the tree, and then uh, the fungus spore germinates and makes this connection. So there's this signaling probably from the tree. So both the fungus and the plant reduce or release signal compounds. And again, genetic changes are made with both organisms to form this cooperative system. Um, this is a diagram of a cell membrane. One of my very favorite things to think about is this business of communication, is this business of recognizing. How does a plant recognize a fungus, for heaven's sakes? It doesn't look like anything you can see. Well, this is a cell membrane, and it's formed with two parts. It has a, a top, an outside part and an inside part. It's a phospholipid, phosphate, lipid, lipid, phosphate. And sticking out from a cell membrane, you've got all of these different kinds of molecules like this, uh, part, usually part protein and part uh, carbohydrate. And these are recognition molecules. So if we think about the complexity here, we've got a, we've got a, a tree root underground and we've got mycorrhizal fungi and you've got pathogenic fungi. What's it gonna do? It has to recognize both of those. It recognizes the mycorrhizal fungus because that's going to be a help. And it has to recognize the pathogen because that's going to spring the, the defensive compounds into, into action. So these, these signal molecules, these recognition molecules are really important and very complex. Um, okay. So they recognize compatible fungus species for, for the establishment of mycorrhizae. Um, but then also the fungus has to recognize the plant, the tree, the whatever. So again, some fungi are specialists, associate with one species of tree or one species of plant, and other fungi are, they don't care, any plant in the storm. So on a practical level, um, there's this book right here, um, that's really good for micro, for mushroom hunters, Rocky Mountain Mushrooms by Habitat. This tells you what mushrooms you're likely to find in what forest types, indicating if you're a mushroom hunter, if you go to this kind of forest, you're gonna find this kind of mushroom, that kind of forest, you'll find other kinds, and that kind, you'll find other kinds. Super book. Kathy Cripps wrote it and illustrated it. She's fun to go into the woods with because she can spot mushrooms that most other people would just walk right by. Now we come to this clever little thing called the Wood Wide Web. <laughs> so some of you are familiar with this book called Finding the Mother Tree, Suzanne Simard from British Columbia. She actually started out working at Oregon State. And some of you might remember somebody named Dave Perry. He, was, he, he got his, his PhD here at MSU um, and he was my office mate for a while. 
extremely sharp guy. And then he went to Oregon State and she studied with him. So there's kind of a connection here. She wrote a paper that was accepted by the Nature, the, the journal Nature, which is British. And it was the editors of Nature Journal that said, this is cute, let's call it the Wood Wide Web. <laughs> well, the press loved it. Uh, ma magazines love cute things like that. And it probably started getting a lot of wrong ideas up about what might be out there. So we know we have communication between and among members of a community through the air. Um, and we know there's the communication underground and what kinds of things move? Well, water moves, carbon compounds move, defense chemicals move, um, electrical signals move. So picture a, a sensitive plant. You know, if you touch it, the leaves collapse. So plants have some electrical signals that go through them. So all these kinds of things are moving in the soil. This has been shown in the labs and in the, in the woods, in the forest, they move. The question is how far and to what extent? So here are some images to not have. <laughs> Plants are not saying, good morning, how are you? No, no. They also are not being big buddies underground and shaking hands with the roots. There's competition under there. Not only is there cooperation, there's competition. So we're not going to think about that. We're going to think like a biologist. How is this happening? So we know that things things do flow, but how is it measured? How do they know? Well, usually what's happening is they use labeling of carbon compounds or a labeling of phosphorus or nitrogen. You can buy uh, radioactive isotopes from labs and you can inject these into plants and then you can follow them with a Geiger counter. That's one way. Another way is to inject one plant and uh, follow it through the roots, through the mycorrhizae to another plant, and then send those tissues to a lab and have them analyzed. That's the expensive one. Um, both ways are used to show that indeed there is movement between at least two plants, if not more. So the systems, by the way, here's a, the mycelium that's under these trees. So again, we have the movement from one tree, let's see, from one tree to the roots, to the mycorrhizae, to the roots, to the, to the other plant. That's the pathway. Now, the most famous studies and some of the earliest ones that paved the way for most of this most recent kinds of research um, were studied in Oregon and in British Columbia by this person, Suzanne Simard. So she was a forester and was told to cut down all these things when she was working for the Forest Service and didn't really want to. Um, she said, no, I think maybe we need to keep some of the things in the forest and not cut them all down. So she did a lot of work with this. So she had two systems. One was the alder, which, which uh, fixes nitrogen. It has bacteria in the roots that fix nitrogen. And mycorrhizal fungi and Douglas fir and ponderosa pine. That was one of her systems. And then the other system was a birch, pretend that's a birch, uh, and Douglas fir. And both systems using these labeled isotopes, she was able to show that water moved both directions from one plant to another, and so did minerals. So did carbon, so did nitrogen, so did hydrogen. Um, I don't remember about phosphorus, but certainly nitrogen. So in general, we have movement following the rules of, of general movement in nature, moving from a higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. It's called movement of source to sink. Source has a higher concentration of water or minerals. A sink has a lower concentration. So you've got movement from higher concentration to lower concentration. So seasonally, she showed this kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> In the fall and the spring, uh, Douglas fir is rapidly photosynthesizing. It's an evergreen. It's not losing its leaves. So it has more photosynthate to move, to, to share, let's say, to, 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 to move to a sink. In the summer, 
The birch has more leaf area. It is making more sugar. So we have movement again from a source to a sink moving the other direction. So we have a seasonal difference here between the summer and the fall and the summer, spring and the fall and the summer. That's kind of the study that started this wood wide web thing. So she also found, looking at this, that the conifers grew better and they were healthier for more years when they were connected with the alder or the birch. In the case of the alder, it was because of the nitrogen, because it's a nitrogen fixer. And then with the um, alder and the birch, there was less predation by the rabbits uh, on the little conifers. And there was less infection with armillaria. That's that honey mushroom, that's that wicked root parasite in the, in the Northwest. So there was, the, the conifers were rather protected by this my, these mycorrhizal system. So remember that this mycorrhizal system has the fungi that wrap around the roots uh, and goes between the cells. So it wraps around the roots and those little nodules. So it's making it, uh, more protection. Now in general, and this is biology in general, uh, mycorrhizae are more important, uh, more critical where habitats are drier. So if a soil is very wet, it's real possible for things to just flow through the soil moisture, whether it's carbon or hydrogen or nitrogen or uh, defense compound or whatever. It, it's possible to just go through the water that surrounds the roots. The drier it gets, the harder it's gonna be for those, those that movement to occur without some help. So my, mycorrhizae seem to be much more critical in drier habitats than in very um, wet habitats. So other studies, this is an international thing, by the way. If you start punching in mycorrhizae in Google, be prepared for a few thousands of, of references. So in Israel, for example, um, they showed transfer between pine and oak. So what we're, what significance here is between different species, between pine and oak. And that's with soil from the field. This becomes very important because then you've got native uh, mycorrhizae, native fungi. You're not introducing a strange fung fungus that may be not what those plants are used to. So let's use soil from the field from which the plants come. Um, a cool study in Europe that went on for five years. This is unusual. Studies, you usually get funding for a year or two and then you have to move on. But they put, these researchers put labeled C13, this is an isotope of carbon, into tall, mature spruce trees. And within two years, they found that C13 was in nearby three other, four other trees, beech, pine, and larch. And they said the significance of that is that the, the carbon compounds were found in the very finest roots. So that does indicate mycorrhizal transfer. And then a defense compound here, uh, a, defo a defoliated Douglas fir, this was supposed to imitate spruce budworm, defoliated Douglas fir. Um, they had increased defense enzymes and transferred carbon compounds to a ponderosa, which then increased its defense compounds. So this is an example of a field study. Uh, sorry, it was a lab study, this particular one. Um, they also said, you know, there could be electrical signals in addition to defense compounds. So any study gets a little wishy-washy sometimes. Now, I've been talking mostly about trees, so they have the ectomycorrhizae. Lots and lots of studies with endomycorrhizae showing the same kinds of things. Stress um, compounds being moved from one to another um, and increasing stress compounds in non-stressed plant. Now, here's one of the most complicated things, but somebody was out to show, and this was in British, in, um, yeah, British Columbia, on how, in this 30, this plot is 30 meters by 30 meters. And they measured every Douglas fir, the genotypes, the DNA of every Douglas fir in that area. And also at the base of every tree, they found the mycorrhizae. And then with DNA studies, they traced other mycorrhizae far away from these, these plants. 
from the biggest trees. So it showed here a network. There were two species of uh, rhizopogon, which is um, looks like that. It's a false truffle. Here it's a false truffle. In Europe, that's the yummy truffle. Um, here it's a false truffle, but it's really common in the forest. Two species, and they wanted to show what were the connections between the trees. And their conclusions were the older the tree, the older and larger the tree, the more connections there were between that tree and others in the, in the network. Old and big, a lot of connections. A youngster, not so many connections with rhizopogon, but remember in this system, there could be lots of other fungi. There could be lots of other mycorrhizae in the soil. So not every tree was connected to every other tree. Um, and you can see that if you follow all the little blue and pink lines. Um, and then of course, if you do a study, be prepared. You're gonna get hammered by somebody. <laughs> so this, in this case, um, the major criticism was, yeah, so they, they made these, these 10 meter, 20 meter uh, statements that yes, this rhizopogon is genetically identical to this one over here. But are they really connected that whole way? Are you showing that they're really connected now? Could we have little things in the soil that find fungi tasty and eat them? So yes, it started out like that, but they're not connected now. That's, that's kind of the history of studies that you do in science. Somebody's gonna poke a hole in it um, for one reason or another. So this is part of um, some of this literature that's out there. It looks like a really cool, complicated study and you get convinced and then somebody says, yeah, but what about? So also in this book, Finding the Mother Tree, um, kind of related to the diagram that you just saw with the biggest, oldest trees having the, the most uh, mycorrhizal connections. Um, the idea is that their trees show kin selection. So kin selection is where you take better care of something related to you than something that's not related to you. So it happens with people, it happens with animals, it happens with bees, it happens with ants, it happens maybe, maybe with plants. They don't know. Her contention is, yes, it does happen with plants, that we've got this big old Douglas fir here called the mother tree that has producing lots of carbon compounds, and she will preferentially send them to seedlings that came from her seeds, or his seeds, as the case may be, compared to these non-kin over here. She seemed to have shown that in the study that she did. Other people say, nonsense. Um, but that's, it's out there for being tested. Now, what they have shown um, is that it's not a matter ever of the fungi growing from a mother tree out to find a seedling over here. It's more a matter of the fungi and the roots growing out like that. And these little seedlings are lucky enough to start growing right in the network that's already present. So they're there, it's very fortunate. Still, they're saying the kin will grow better than the non-kin. That, that really is open for more, uh, I would say, more experimentation. Now, they have shown that in labs, roots do recognize kin and non-kin. And again, this is with, with agricultural crops, that um, little plants will show less branching if they're grown with kin than if they're competing with non-kin. At least that was one of the, the uh, conclusions. So there's a lot of information out there. <laughs> now, possible implications for forestry. And this was her, this was Simard's whole idea of, of a lot of this information of how to change some forestry practices. Um, you've all seen a clear cut. They're, to me, they're not pleasant to the eye. Um, there's lots of erosion, um, all that. And if you don't get it replanted right away, it's gonna be really hard to revegetate. So the idea is instead of clear cutting, leave some patches of trees or maybe big single trees because those trees are going to have mycorrhizal networks 
the roots and fungi leafing out from them, branching out from them. And any seedling that falls into that area will have ready-made mycorrhizal connection. Um, the other thing is, yeah, in addition to the erosion aspects of a clear cut, you've got the spring melt problem of where things run off. And then you've lost, if, if a clear cut stays unvegetated for over a year, it's going to lose a lot of those, those live viable mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizal fungi spores. So the idea is replant as soon as possible. And according to Kathy Cripps, who's my mentor on a lot of this, she's, she's worked with white bark pine. And she says the best way is to take soil from a place like this that has the native uh, fungi growing in it, inoculate seedlings in the greenhouse, let them grow for a year. It takes two to three to five months to make a good mycorrhizal connection. And they, they're grown in what's called cone tainers. They're little like ice cream cones, real skinny ice cream cones like that. And the, tree roots, or the trees are grown in this, those cone tainers. And then you take the seedling out of the container and it's already got the mycorrhizae with it and then plant those. That's the best way to revegetate. So I see pictures of kids, for example, on these teams that are out with a backpack of seedlings, sticking little seedlings in the ground in July. Well, let's talk about water in July. Um, let's talk about two to three months to make a mycorrhizal connection in a growing season. That's probably not the most successful way to revegetate. So a lot of knowledge about um, mycorrhizae, I think, is a good idea, but I'm not a forester. Okay, so I'm sure they have their ideas too. So some conclusions about all of this, and there's a lot of conflicting um, data out there, but here are my conclusions. Ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae are essential for the survival of plants in a natural atmosphere. Plant, the trees can't grow without the mycorrhizae. The mushrooms can't grow without the trees. You gotta have them both. What does communication mean? Does it mean, hey, how are you? No, it means you're transferring resources underground usually between uh, species that can afford to, to transfer them. So water is transferred. Um, Carbon, other nutrients, the trace metals, I haven't even mentioned trace minerals. I haven't even mentioned the trace minerals like calcium and magnesium and things that plants need that the mycorrhizae gather from the soil that help. Um, and they move from source to sink. They move from higher concentration to a lower concentration. Um, and those resources that go to a, a recipient plant can be used for better growth and better survival. That being said, there's also the school of thought that says, don't overemphasize this because other, other explanations are possible in some systems. So it could be that if the roots of a plant are growing close enough together, they'll just transfer them right, right there between the roots themselves. Yeah, that's probably possible. Uh, if there's enough water, especially, if the soil conditions are right, again, if there's enough water, enough uh, aeration in the soil, maybe things can just reach out from one root to the another and travel through the water in the soil. They don't need the mycorrhizae for that particular thing. We really don't know what bacterial communities might do. Uh, we know that there are electrical systems that go through plants. That's a whole field of study. Um, we know that there are those. So. It's not only mycorrhizal connections that maybe make this transfer between uh, plants, but the plants can't live without the mycorrhizae. That's, that's the, the bottom take home. So thinking about a forest, um, first of all, you can show things in the lab that you can't always show in the field. You can control things in the lab. You control the light, the soil, the, the strains that you're using, everything you can control and say, yes, this is what happens. Does it happen in the forest? Well, we hope so. <laughs> um, and you can't control things in the forest. So think about here. Think about the difference between this year and last year. Think about what might be our next summer compared to last summer. No. Awful to think about, but 
You know, it's possible. You just can't control the weather. So this is my bottom line about teaching biology forever. When somebody would say, is that always true? You go, in biology, you have usuallys, you have generallys. And in this circumstances, yes, this is, this is what happens. This is what my data show. But you can rarely say this always happens. That never happens. You can't say that. So you have to look at the data. You have to look at the paper. You have to say, well, it sounds good. Maybe it really did work at the, on that hillside in British Columbia. Would it work here with, pond, with Black Pole Pine in Yellowstone Park? Well, maybe. Have to test it, okay? Always something to test. So some references. Um, botany books, of course, just always talk about this system and also give us an anatomy of how things work in a, within a plant. The Native Montana Native Plant Society has a YouTube site, and Kathy Cripps has a really good session on there on mycorrhizae in Montana. She worked a lot with white bark pine and with aspens, so she has a lot of experimental uh, experience with at mycorrhizae in those trees. Now, some of you are familiar with The Hidden Life of Trees. I had a lot of trouble with that book because he tried to make trees sound like people. And trees are plants. I'm sorry, they're, they're not people, they're plants. Same thing with Susan Simard with Finding the Mother Tree. Her explanation for trying to, to uh, anthropomorphize trees was that people can relate to them better. You can relate to a better to a tree if you sh show a smiley face on the trunk. Okay, I don't. Um, and then a couple of books here, Kathy's book on the mycorrhizae in Montana forests. Some of you have read Braiding Sweetgrass about how to live with trees and the native use of trees. Beautiful book. Um, Meg Lohman on the Arbor Knot. We're, we've talked now about what's underground. What's at the top of a tree that's 30 meters high? What's up there? That's what she's looking for, at looking to see what's up there. Um, and then I, I plug this all the time to any parent, grandparent, or anything last child in the woods. They're showing a lot of trouble with kids not being outside, not getting out into the woods. They're afraid to go off the sidewalk in the grass mm -hmm. uh, because they don't know what's there. Well, that doesn't make for good mental health to not be in nature. That's what the evidence is showing. So these are just some references that I'd like to. Okay, questions? Thank you so very much. That was so interesting. Yeah. So, if you're out here online, um, please put your questions into the box there, and Rich will be um, asking them for you just to share. And uh, now, any questions? I will bring the microphone to you in the audience here. Just raise your hand and uh, I'll go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for that. It's fascinating. Um, you said that mycorrhizal networks are more critical in drier habitats. And I'm just curious if you know anything about the situation in the desert. And are there less plants that associate to mycorrhizal networks in the desert? No. They're mycorrhizal. There are mycorrhizal systems between the saguaros, between the shrubs, all those. Really? Yeah. Between the saguaros? Sure. Wow, that's amazing. So yeah. do you know if like more desert species become reliant on mycorrhizal networks or less because they can't, the mycorrhizal networks can't form in like the sand or the dryness or do you think it's well, kind of just similar? There are wet years in the desert and a lot of things happen in the desert and then they just go dormant for years at a time. And then there's a wet year and the, the cacti bloom and the annuals come up and it's beautiful. And then everything goes dormant again. So it'd be a system adapted for mostly dry. But again, the general rule is if you have a perennial in a native habitat, it has fungi with it. That's as close to an always as I can think of. <laughs> Thank you. If you fertilize a tree, by the way, it'll say, I'm not going to spend my carbon on the fungus. No, you don't need, it won't form a mycorrhiza. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Rich, do we have a question from our online audience? We have several. Um, Rebecca asks, do cold temperatures in the winter kill the particular fungi that attack various trees? 
Are you talking about pathogens attacking, or if you, are, does she mean these mycorrhizal fungi? I believe she may be talking about things like uh, the rusts and the uh, lights. Um, well, the answer has been no. The answer has been our winters have not been cold enough, and that's why the white bark pine is having such problems with with the uh, white pine blister rust. Um, some of, I've lived here for almost 60 years, and I remember some really cold winters when it would be 20 and 30 below for two and three weeks at a time. We might have two or three nights at right now. That's not enough to kill the insects and to kill the fungi um, that cause the problems. Will it kill the well-adapted mycorrhizal fungi? No. Here we go. Okay. Uh, we'll do another interview from the audience. Hi, thank you. Um, I attended your lightning class. Okay. Okay. Um, so something you said early in your talk was um, the presence of these micro mycorrhizal um, systems in our yards or in our garden that it wasn't as probably. You're not going to have mycorrhizal systems in a garden. Okay. That's, that's kind of a given. And the first place, those are annual plants, right? But in our climate, not they're annuals. And and to, a, micro, a mycorrhizal fungus has to have a plant. And the plant usually, almost without exception, with biology, is a perennial. Garden plants are annuals. They but die. They have it, like our vegetable. Many of those plants are perennials, just not the climate. But the, I'm, uh, it generates some confusion in my mind because I attended a fabulous soil event last summer, the summer before. And one of the takeaways I had was the importance of composting, even in our garden, to create these relationships. Okay, um, compost. For healthy, healthy compost is adding organic matter. That's adding carbon and nitrogen. It's not adding fungi. It's adding things to the soil that make the soil itself richer and making minerals more available. I don't garden, I don't compost. Um, but it's kind of like when you plant a tree you put in compost or you put in um, peat moss or something to amend the soil to make it better for the plant roots to grow. And that's what composting basically does. It's, it, un, it makes soil more crumbly, less compacted, so the roots have a better time growing. I think that's the major use of compost, not making mycorrhizal fungi, unless gardeners know something I don't know. Okay, Rich, do you have another question from uh, on my end? Yeah, um, we have a couple oh. questions from Karen and Kathy uh, about um, mycorrhizal, mycorrhizae in uh, potting soil and commercial soils. Um, do we, there are commercial soils you can buy that contain mycorrhizae. Uh, are those, will those attack be beneficial to planters? Yeah, I understand you can do that. And you can order mycorrhizae too. You can order mycorrhizae themselves. So I understand there are some nurseries that put mycorrhizae with the trees and bushes that they sell. That's what I, I don't know if any of them here do it, but I know some nurseries do do that. Potting soil in general is, if you just take it out of a bag, it's pretty sterile. And they make it that way, so you're not putting in a lot of my, of microbes. Now, do are they talking about some potting soil that's available that has mycorrhizae in it? Yeah, so if you buy potting soil that already has mycorrhizae in it, would that be right. beneficial? Well, that would probably be the endomycorrhizae if you for potting soil, and that's that's kind of an unknown. Some people say what you're doing then is not maybe introducing. Um, mycorrhizae that are native to the plant that you're putting in the pot. So it's not generally recommended, actually, because you're introducing foreign fungi into a new system. You want to use natives whenever you can. Go in the woods and get some soil and put it in the I did this when I planted some grasses. I went out in the park and I dug up some soil and put it with my grasses that I planted and they did beautifully. It would not have been a good idea for me to, to get the commercial stuff and put it with those grasses. 
Thank you. Um, we have some more questions in our audience here. Yeah, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is, what helps with microalgae flourish? I mean, obviously, when you get a forest fire, you get charcoal, you get a regeneration of forests, and what you get is fungus growing in the spring. Um, is it the charcoal? Is it just the action to the soil so you know that the source is now that you have? And one other question or two would be about your uh, talking about electric thermal going through these. Is there, I don't know if you're familiar with electric culture, can you add thermal to the ground, grounding rods? And will that I think you probably can. can. I, it probably has been done, but I haven't I haven't seen it. I just know that there are some people that trace electrical currents between plants. For gardens, I don't know. There are? Anybody used it? Have to ask Toby yeah, Day. I just I've been following him for several years and we started visiting this last year and and people that do we have like I know somebody I can email about that. <laughs> if you, if you want to leave me leave me something, I will email Toby and see if what he knows about it. He's teaching a class in gardening for, for Ollie this next semester. Um, now, forest fires. They Usually they say that mycorrhizae survive forest fires just fine, mostly because heat goes up. And it goes through, and yes, it, it burns up some... some um, organic matter and then things grow well. I mean, you can you can see after the the Yellowstone fires, first the nitrogen fixers came in, first the lupins came in, then the trees came in, then the, the um, lodgepoles came in. Um, the only exception to that would be if, like what has happened in Yellowstone in places where you've had a windstorm and the trees are just lying down mm -hmm. in the same place and the fire just, Stayed there and burned and burned and burned all those trees. And that made the soil pretty sterile. Pretty sterile. Um, now the rationale for burning fields around here—they used to burn every fall, right? Used to, there used to be burning of the agricultural fields every fall because they said that was putting nutrients back into the soil. They don't do that anymore so much. Um, they say no, that's probably not the best practice. Um, that's basically what I know. I, I do know that in agriculture, there's a huge uh, surge of information now and, and emphasis on some what's known as soil health. So they're getting more and more interested in what keeps the soil healthy. Um, well, it's not monoculture and it's not the same crop every year after year. So they're, they're starting to think a lot about what, what is gonna keep a soil really healthy with the microbes now, agricultural plants are not mycorrhizal, um, but there are other microbes in the soil that are very important for plant functioning. Um, so yeah, the, the burning has kind of gone out of fashion from what I've seen around here. We have time for two more questions, maybe, and I just wanna um, let people know online that um, if you don't get your question, we will forward those to Sharon and she can um, get back to you. I probably know somebody um, to ask. One more question uh, online, and then I'll take one more from the audience. Uh, yeah, there were several people who asked online, uh, what can you do to encourage uh, mycorrhizal networks in your garden and in your, on your own properties? Again, the garden thing, you're dealing with annuals. <laughs> Well, um, in the yard, in the yard, okay. If if you want a, a wild yard, um, you plant the wild plant flowers, and there are fungal spores in in the air all the time. Chances are they'll find those plants, and you'll get some mycorrhizal connections on their own. Um, the secret, I think, is to have healthy plants, plants that are healthy enough that they can spare some sugars. <laughs> so, I mean, they have to sacrifice some sugars to make a, a mycorrhizal connection. So they have to be healthy enough for that. Um, but you can't fertilize them or then they'll be too healthy and say, why should I spend my sugars on you? So there's a, there's a, a middle ground here on just the right kind of healthy plant. 
And again, fungal spores, think about how many are out there. And they're there. Maybe not in the middle of a clear cut, but they're there. Okay, uh, one last question from the audience here. Say you have a uh, 500 acre clear cut somewhere in the forest of the Northern Rocky Mountains, near here perhaps, and you don't replant it, how long would your mycorrhizal network hold out? And what would it take to reestablish that network and get trees growing again in there? Um, a long time. <clears throat> I'm, how many of you are familiar with the diaper line? of the town. That was clear cut before we moved to Bozeman. And we moved to Bozeman in 1966. There's not been very much revegetation there, has there? Now, what comes what comes in naturally, usually, if you don't pay attention to it, is grasses and shrubs start coming in and wildflowers, which changes the mycorrhizal system from ecto to endo. Then there will be some trees that might start encroaching in which case, you know, you've got then you've got an ecto system going, um, but it can take a long time. Thinking about the diaper line, thinking also about the uh, Bear Canyon ski area. How long has that been bare? I assume that was cleared for skiing. Okay. Uh Thank you so much, Sharon. Again, we have to be out of the library to get held up in 15 minutes, so that's why I have to put off our uh, question and answer. But I just wanted to let you know, if you signed up for the live stream, you will, you will be receiving um, an email with a link to the recording. This is being recorded tonight. And if you want to um, share a recording or watch us again, you can go to our website at gallatinvalleyearthday.org. Um, and uh, in a few days, we should have the recording up on that website. Um, if you enjoyed this, we have a whole series of talks coming on. I encourage you to look at the poster back there if you're here or a live stream. Um, we'll send you um, a link to see a list of our upcoming talks. Our next talk is an in-person only. The best habitat is Unlogged Forest with Mike Garrity. It's at the Museum of the Rockies on January 24th at 6.30 p.m., our next live stream talk that you can sign up for is about white bark pine, a species worth protecting with Aaron Shanahan on Thursday, February 8th at 7 p.m. If you want to attend that live, it's at the Hope Lutheran Church. So thank you for coming. Um, really enjoyed the evening. Thanks again, thank Sharon. It was really great. Have a good evening. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. It's really great.